Uh, my topic this morning is bimetallic arbitrage. This phrase covers arbitrage between the gold and the silver market. From my point of view, this is a superb strategy which is available to everybody. The point is that if you use, uh, yesterday we talked about the accumulation strategy and talked about the trading strategy and especially the trading strategy has a big disadvantage which I didn't point out but I have to point out today because that disadvantage is sidestepped if you use bimetallic arbitrage. The disadvantage of the trading strategy involving just one of the metals is that you are really doing arbitrage between gold and paper or silver and paper because when you are selling you are invested in paper for however short period of time but you are invested in paper and therein is a great danger. The great danger is that when the last contangle the curtain is fall uh, is fallen on the last contango in Washington which is the event we are talking about when gold and silver will no longer be available for any price when this happens you might be caught on the wrong foot if you happen to be short if you happen to be invested in paper at that moment, then you, you take a huge loss which could uh, weaken your otherwise uh, positive results. So that is a disadvantage. You would like to develop a strategy which does not involve paper or if, well, perhaps this is just an ideal which you cannot uh, realize 100 percent, but if you are in paper this time period should be reduced to as short a period as possible. So uh, I think what we uh, can say with confidence is that the bimetallic arbitrage, whereas you switch from gold into silver and back is avoiding that trap or that threat and therefore it is a superb strategy. The question is what clues you have to indicate that this is the time to go from gold to silver or the other way around. And uh, there is such a thing as bimetallic ratio. This is the silver, the gold price in dollars divided by the silver price. And this uh, indicator has been around for as long as uh, the US dollar existed. And uh, the range within which it has been moving is 15 at the low end and 100 at the high end. The low end was fixed by uh, monetary legislation in the United States shortly after the Republic was established. At, uh, so it was 15 or 15 and a half and then it stabilized because uh, there were various influences but let's just say 15, we are not interested in the fractional part. At the low end was, uh, was uh, fixed up until the civil war in the United States at which time the, uh, it was destabilized but still stayed 
at this low end. And then what happened was that after the Civil War, the um, uh, legislation, in quotation mark, forgot to list the standard silver dollar as a coin which to which the mint uh, was open. It mentioned only gold coins. Silver was struck as subsidiary coin but only on account of the treasury. It was no longer uh, an unlimited and free coinage of silver whereby everybody could take silver to the mint uh, if it had the right quantity and quality then it was it could be exchanged for brand new silver coins uh, on a one-to-one -one basis. So in other words there was no charge for minting. If there was a charge it was for refining or, um, or uh, uh, other ad additional services which the mint. But the coinage itself, the cost of coinage was abs absorbed by the government in the same way as the cost of construction of highways was. And in fact this uh, analogy was valid because the circulating pool, the pool of circulating uh, coins was considered as a kind of highway for commerce and it was one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, functions of the government to provide that uh, service, uh, that highway, make it available to everybody free of charge. So that is the low end of the range, around 15. The high end, say around 100, and again I'm not worried about the fractional part, was achieved I think twice and uh, uh, if you want to characterize these uh, two events you might say that uh, they were at the height of the bear market in, in monetary metals. So in particular uh, we are now closer to the high end we are between 70 and 80, say, this bimetallic ratio, which means that uh, gold is, the pr dollar price of gold is 70 or 80 times higher than the dollar price of the silver, of silver. And uh, the, when it was 100, then uh, that was at the height of the, the bear market. Uh, in monetary metals. So I'm not really trying to make a theory out of that, but this is an interesting observation that when uh, the metallic currency system is strong, then we have a low bimetallic ratio. We are at the lower end of the of the range. And when paper money is in the saddle and in the driver's seat, then we have the high end, which is close to a hundred. And as the crisis develops, the monetary crisis, the crisis of the international monetary system, the crisis of the dollar-based monetary system. It's an irredeemable currency system. The crisis develops, then the ratio tends to fall. This is an experimental an observation and there is some theory which would support that but I think more work would have to be done before one could say that 
this is it. This is what is happening. So I'm just offering this idea to you that as the, our present crisis unfolds, you may expect the bimetallic ratio to fall from here and fall as low as 15 or close to that. But this is just uh, an intuitive idea which I, I cannot fully support but uh, as things presently are that's my best uh, judgment. I would ignore all those people uh, like uh, Ted Butler and uh, his cohorts who say that uh, silver is so scarce in the world in comparison with gold that this ratio is going to go to one. They, uh, they have done on record to say that. I think this is uh, this is uh, off the mark completely. This this is just uh, uh, you know uh, uh, a vision which only those people who have a, a very distorted view. The fact is that when it comes to monetary metals, scarcity is not an issue. Scarcity or abundance is not an issue because to start with, monetary metal has to be sufficiently abundant to serve as monetary metal. I mean, a, a rare metal cannot serve. Uh, in, in particular, platinum was tried, but it failed. The Russian uh, Tsarist government in the 19th century tried to uh, introduce a third monetary metal, platinum, and that was a failure. The, those coins didn't circulate. But why? Because they were too scarce. You've got to have something abundant enough that you can, you, you, you can saturate the market with coins and after you have saturated the market, the mint, by issuing these coins, the market is saturated, the coins will not go into hiding or into uh, cookie jars or just remain conversation piece or uh, uh, keepsake, but they will actually go into circulation if there's no sufficient abundance, this is not going to happen. And historically only two metals have met this standard and that is silver and gold. And perhaps this uh, order is valid because I think the um, uh, circulation of silver, we don't know for sure, but probably predated the circulation of gold co coins. Gold coins also existed, but they did not circulate. They served for the purposes of uh, royal ransom. If a king was kidnapped, uh, silver coins would never <laughs> take yeah. him out of <laughs> the captivity, it had to be gold. Or when the United States purchased something, some territory like Louisiana or Alaska, uh, it wasn't, the transaction was not consummated in handing over silver coins. It was gold coins. Uh, well, but I'm really, I'm referring to much earlier episodes, I think silver was the medium of exchange, especially when it came to paying wages or uh, buying uh, uh, supplies for everyday needs. So uh, these are the only two monetary metals and, and I, for the life of me, cannot buy that theory that silver has become uh, scarce because of the industrial uh, the man consumed it and that silver has been removed forever so now we have a, a shortage situation. I don't believe that. I think uh, silver, yes, has disappeared from circulation, from the market and there's less silver, much less silver is available for trading today than say 10 or 15 or more years ago. However, you cannot 
take it for granted that the missing silver is built into uh, aerospace technology or electronics or this and that or that and cannot be recovered at a reasonable cost. You have to assume that a very large part of this disappearing silver is in fact av available in monetary form but it's not coming out at the present price. And maybe it's not coming out under the irredeemable monetary system at all, ever. It, uh, this system has to collapse before the silver in the world, which exists in monetary form, will reappear. This is, to my mind, the only reasonable explanation uh, for the fact that there appears to be a shortage of silver, but this is only appearance. In fact, the silver is in hiding, and in hiding to a greater extent than gold is, because that's also true for gold. Uh, monetary gold is continually going into hiding. And, and sometimes it can be coaxed out, as right now, with this high, very high US dollar value, which we have, 87, I heard the latest. Fantastic, if you think of <laughs> just a few weeks ago, it was low 70s. But I'm sure this coaxes some gold out of hiding. Perhaps silver as well, but. I'm not sure about silver. I'm quite sure about gold. So the uh, the uh, lower gold price is explained by that fact. This this is happening all the time. Uh, on not uh, but not forever because at one point we know we'll reach the point where the basis, the gold basis, will collapse and start falling into a bottomless pit, and that's it. That's the end of the uh, the, uh, ir the regime of irredeemable uh, dollar. So th this is the ratio, the bimetallic ratio, which offers itself and uh, as a as a reasonable indicator, which could guide, which could guide. Uh, by metallic arbitrage when you are selling say gold simultaneously with buying the equivalent amount of silver and vice versa but you need an indicator to guide your trade but if you really start to think about this at a deeper level you will come to the conclusion that the bimetallic ratio is not really a good indicator. Because if we accept the fact that the gold price is manipulated, the world price of gold, and the silver price is also being manipulated, then it follows that the uh, uh, bimetallic ratio is also manipulated uh, or at least it's giving or could give you false signals. So this is far from being a perfect uh, indicator. The bimetallic ratio is is tainted, just the same as the gold price is tainted and the silver price is tainted. So we have to look for further for a more reliable indicator which would g be the guiding star of bimetallic arbitrage. And it won't take very long before we uh, come to the conclusion, oh by the way there are others, you can take the least rate for gold and least rate for silver and either take the difference or the ratio of the two and ma many other candidates. but. Again, it's the same criticism. They are not reliable. They are subject to manipulation, and therefore it could lead to uh, the wrong decision and wrong steps in this arbitrage. So uh, I'm suggesting to make the long story short, the basis 
is the answer. <laughs> and gold bases and the silver bases. This, these two indicators cannot be <coughs> falsified because they uh, are telling you if there is still any source of gold or any source of silver which is flowing to the market. And the, any change in the intensity of this flow of gold and silver to the market is going to show up. Uh, the, the, the basis is an extremely sensitive indicator what's going on and it gives you advance warning as far as it's humanly possible that uh, these sources may be drying up or temporarily the flow could intensify or whatever is going on that is the only reliable indicator so we are back at the grain trade. I would like to offer this to you, how the uh, same idea would work in the grain trade. And I think this is very convincing and I'm sure you will find uh, this comparison uh, useful. To, in order to understand bimetallic arbitrage, you uh, start with the grain trade where basis was used long before the gold and silver basis came into the vogue. Suppose there is a, uh, an elevator operator with two bins. Sorry. What's that? It's a, it's a cell phone. Oh. oh. Okay. There are two bins and let's suppose that it's at the end of the copier so the two bins are empty and the uh, elevator operator uh, is going after two particular products wheat and corn and he's uh, going to buy it's a continuous process even though it is uh, condensed in, say a one month period by the time all this grain finds its way to the elevators. So he is buying both wheat and corn. But the question is which of the two products should have the priority? So he has to look around and analyze the situation which, which he, he does because th this is very important for him that he offers his warehousing services to whichever commodity commands the greater demand for these services because they are going to pay the top price for warehousing services. The, uh, the owners of wheat or the owners of gold uh, and uh, the, the question is how will he know where the greater demand is because that's where he wants to offer his services before he offers it to the other. And uh, well, you think about it then you come to the conclusion that it's the basis. He has to look at the wheat basis and the corn basis and he will buy, he will always buy the grain which ever commands the higher basis because that's a proxy for the price of the warehousing space so he is offering his warehousing space to the higher bidder and the higher bidder is the, the commodity which commands the higher basis. So you, you think it over and I'm sure you will come to agree with me on that. Now this is not carved into stone. He could start buying the wheat because that basis is higher but as uh, conditions change it could be that corn becomes 
the corn bases becomes wider than the base, the wheat bases. At that point, he is going to buy the wheat and start filling the other bin of his elevator. And he is going to do this until he has filled the two bins. And if there is any empty space still, well then at that point he will have to make a decision. But the point is that he has a guiding star. He's not in the dark, which otherwise without the basis he would be. He would know which of the two grains is more um, in demand as far as the demand for the storage space is concerned. Now, suppose he filled his bins and so on and uh, and uh, then something happens which is in the news and which uh, catches his eyes and tries to make conclusions uh, as far as his own business is concerned. Suppose that he reads in the news that there's a corn blight say in another continent, not necessarily in the same. So if this, if, if this elevator is in North America, he could find that there's a corn blight in, uh, in Asia or wherever. Would that have a, an implication to his own business? Well, <laughs> certainly it has. And if he is, is an astute businessman, he will start making space, elevator space, available for corn, because that's going to, perhaps not immediately, but going to command a higher basis <coughs> in relationship to the wheat basis, because there is this blight. So when that this particular crop reaches uh, maturity and harvesting, then there will be a shortage, com comparatively speaking, of corn because of the blight which happened earlier and as a consequence the corn basis will be higher so he's anticipating he's not acting because the corn basis is already higher he's just uh, just anticipating but it's a very reasonable uh, anticipation that the corn basis will be higher than the wheat basis so in preparation for this event which may be a month or two months down the line, he is going to make elevator space available for corn, for buying corn when the, the harvest in that part of the world uh, comes in. So this means he is going to sell, speed up, step, step up his sales of wheat just to make the elevator space available for corn. So disregarding the wheat price, he's going to speed up his, his uh, sales, wheat sales, and try to slow down his sales of corn. And the purpose is to make the elevator space available for more corn. So that is what an astute elevator operator would be doing if he reads about a serious corn blight in some other parts of the world or, or even in, in the same country. So uh, the point is that he's doing a kind of arbitrage which is obviously not a bimetallic arbitrage, but a bi-grain type of arbitrage, which is, which is a, a, a very uh, interesting and very well-informed uh, business move. So what I'm suggesting to you is that the change of the, the relative change in the wheat basis and the corn basis is going to give valid clues to the elevator operator just 
w where he should concentrate his efforts to make the extra elevator space available. The elevator space is limited and there are in this example two s sources of demand for that space and he's not in the dark about which uh, demand he should try to satisfy because uh, first because his decision is going to affect his bottom line very dramatically because if he buys the basis when it's higher then his potential profit is that much higher because he's anticipating the higher basis to fall and by the end of the crop year to go to uh, to its minimum and at that point he will be in the position to calculate his profits and since he started from a higher level of basis his uh, profits will have to show that if he just ignored that and said half of half and half because he has equal bin equal size bins and he just filled both one with corn the other with wheat he would miss that advantage which he could have if he followed the basis. So this is another example which shows the uh, superior uh, marketing um, approach of those elevator operators who are buying the basis, trading the basis rather than trading the price. And exactly the same argument uh, is applicable to the by metallic arbitrage where the uh, person who wants to build up an inventory of both silver and gold is not in the dark in what ratio he should allocate his resources to one or the other monetary metal. He's not in the dark because he has a guiding star which is or two guiding stars really because uh, he can consider the silver basis and the gold basis and uh, take a common denominator and uh, always buy the higher basis and correspondingly sell the lower one. Now how do we do 15 the minutes. 15 yeah. minutes? And then we can do the question and answer. Oh, we can start it now. Start the question? Uh, yeah, but you have 15 minutes. You want to continue? Okay. okay. Then I, I continue. Okay. And then, then we do it. Then, then we have take the questions. All right. Now, uh, th this is the problem for us. Uh, and by us, I mean people of modest means. Of course, if you were a very large operator, you wouldn't have a problem. Uh, with selling but I found as a person of modest means and also I've been told by others so I have this feedback from uh, my uh, consultants my, those who listen to my advice that uh, selling is the problem buying is not so much the problem for the time being not so much of a problem uh, because you can buy anonymously and as long as you don't sell the tax implications are either non-existent or easily manageable but once you start selling which the concept of arbitrage would seem to imply then selling can hardly ever be done anonymously that's one problem and the other problem is that there are tax implications see as long as you don't sell capital gains are not payable I think in most yeah. countries but they may come to soon <laughs> but for the time being no capital gains if you don't sell but in any case even if there are, would be capital gains it's it's uh, uh, not realistic because uh, how can they uh, just how can they find out that you uh, you are reporting 
the true situation. So the, uh, let's just stay with this, that little problem with buying in comparison with serious problems with selling. So uh, people of small or modest means uh, would like to know whether bimetallic arbitrage offers offers a reasonable strategy to them or are they out of this particular game. My answer is that you can do bimetallic arbitrage even if you never ever sell. And that's because I would consider Excuse me, I would consider what I call synthetic selling. Synthetic selling. And it means this is stretching the notion of selling, it's stretching the notion of arbitrage, but I think this is a reasonable thing to do. What I mean is, if you come to think of it, if you are not buying, in a way you are selling. You are, there's a buy signal. And you are not buying, in spite of the signal. This really means selling. Now I leave that thought with you. You, you mull, <laughs> mull it over. Uh, <laughs> I, I know when you hear this first, you feel a little bit uncertain. <laughs> but but th let's just put it that way. Not buying when otherwise you would is the best substitute for selling. So, uh, okay, there is such a thing as synthetic selling and therefore you pursue the strategy of bimetallic arbitrage uh, by following two accumulation uh, accounts, by setting up two accumulation accounts. One is for gold and the other is for silver. You always buy but never sell. Yet the idea is that suppose now you buy gold and the idea is that you should be selling silver but you are not selling silver because you follow that synthetic approach so the fact that you are not buying silver at the same time is a, a synthetic selling I think I'm uh, pretty well out of time, so I will continue after the break, but I will close with this. By actu actually, I can also say there's such a thing as synthetic buying, which is not selling. And, and uh, you, put these <laughs> you put these two together and you will find that uh, really what we are doing is we are just stretching the meaning of the word buying and selling and arbitrage. All right, so after the break I'm going to ask and answer the question what should guide bimetallic arbitrage? Should gold or the variation in the gold basis should give you the clue Or should it be the variation of silver bases? That comes after the break. So now we have question and answer. Questions. Yes. Professor, would it be fair to say that the arbitrage advantage that you're speaking about with the, with the gold and silver basis depends on a limited number of people understanding it? And that if, in fact, everyone understood the gold and silver basis, that this arbitrage advantage would be wiped out. Yes, I, I would agree with that. Uh, I, uh, the, market, the markets are, are very big, you understand. So um, if more and more people uh, 
will understand the advantages of bimetallic arbitrage, this will not eliminate your possibilities. But it's, it must be true that the more people who follow arbitrage uh, participate in, in that and act the same way because they follow the same uh, clues uh, will eliminate whatever advantage you had before when fewer number of people did that. So uh, it would not discourage me just the fact, uh, for instance, uh, you might also have said, sir, why do you have a conference such as this? Why don't you just keep the information to yourself? And that, uh, well, the answer is, that, uh, of course, uh, I consider myself a scientist and therefore it would be my duty to share the, uh, the truth which I have found and justify it. But, but uh, I don't think that this dissemination of knowledge would seriously hurt anybody's interest. I don't think so because the market is, is large enough to accommodate that. And the other thing is that you also have to uh, reckon with the density of people at large who, who, are, who, are, who are intellectually too lazy to go through the thought process which will justify this particular strategy. It's a good question and I was, it just caused me to think that, that if we did pursue this strategy and then opened up a uh, Economist magazine and saw the professor and his basis theory there, it might be time to switch strategies. Now, <laughs> uh, uh, if you carry this argument to its bitter end, you will see that if it was possible that everybody was doing this type of arbitrage. This would spell the end of the irredeemable monetary system. <laughs> so actually, it is for the better. <laughs> yes. Uh, professor, uh, about the green elevator, you use uh, two grain to arbitrage uh, using the basis as a guideline. The basis is it in terms of absolute dollar, the, you know, the calculated basis in terms of US dollar or in terms of percentage. I assume it's using dollar because it's the cost of storage. You know, the, the bigger basis means bigger income for the elevator. Uh, is that the case? And then how about using bimetallic when you calculate the basis? Is it because silver and gold, they are different prices, and when you calculate basis of silver, and gold. Of course, for gold we put a trend, and silver we put a trend, but is it using percentage or using dollar? You know, the basis between spot price and uh, future price, they give you the dollars. Yeah. Do you use percentage or you use uh, dollar, dollar. To, as a guideline? Yeah, in calculating the basis, as I, I, I believe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Philip, um, he's asking the question uh, 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 to calculate the basis in the, in, in the differential between the two, would you be using the dollar amount or the percentage in the difference between those two? Well, you have to start with a, uh, a unit of account, and I assume this is the dollar. And only after that can you go. I mean, these are not alternatives, what you are talking about, are they? Is this, uh, that's, I'm I not mean, sure, Phil. For example, let's say you have wheat at a certain price, you have corn at a certain price. The basis for a green elevator is very straightforward. You calculate that the basis is a dollar amount that you will be getting the income to cover its overhead and things like that. But it's not, it's actually, no. it's actually a ratio. ratio. It's a ratio yeah. between the two dollar amounts. The basis is not a dollar amount. The, do the basis is a ratio between two dollar amounts. So, so it doesn't matter what the percentage? units are. Yeah, it doesn't matter what the units change. are. The ratio is still the same. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the money. It's the ratio. The okay. basis. So of the corn, for example, you have a ratio of the basis. The basis of corn. You plot the graph using the percent. Uh, yeah. The percentage. And then on the width, you use a ratio of percentage and you compare the two. With a high 
basis, you will put more corn, you got a higher basis, and then you change to sell more wheat, things like that. I think yes, that's right. For the metallics, I say. Would you agree? Yeah. I think that's correct, yes. yes. Yeah. Because I asked a question, because uh, it makes sense for the elevator, because the, the basis is where you're getting your money. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I just want to know whether um, Tom's going to have both the silver and the gold basis on his website. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask me nice enough, yeah, sure. <laughs> one of the, actually, one of the tools on the website will be the biometallic sort of comparison of the two bases. Uh, bases, as it were. Bases. <laughs> That's right, yes. Sorry for being snide. <laughs> yes? You have a, kind of an artificial situation with where well, you don't have a worldwide shortage of silver, but you have a premium in the states. How do you evaluate your basis then? There was where it seems to be more localized. It was seemed like it's elsewhere. It doesn't seem like it's a problem to get silver. If I go up to Canada, I can get silver as well. In the states, it's, it's much more localized, and you have a healthy premium on, on the uh, first system. <coughs> How do you deal with the <coughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it will be local everywhere. This the, the states is showing the way, showing the future. It will be local everywhere. So my answer to that is that uh, the local basis already shows a large degree of backwardation because the 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 basis is negative, and maybe per permanently so. So in other words, this is not yet the signal we are anticipating. It will be one particular market. By the way, this is an unfinished business from yesterday, because uh, unfortunately we ran out of time yesterday, and I did not explain it when I drew those curves, charts for the basis. But presently, these local markets in the States, also in Germany and a number of other countries where the uh, supply of gold coins and small bars has dried up, uh, in these cases it's already per, uh, backwardation. And as far as one can see, probably they are permanent. But that's not yet the indicator for the big picture, that the gold basis and the silver basis is in permanent backwardation, because we have to have a global basis. Now, what is the global basis? Well, I would like to invite your opinions as well, but I am suggesting it to you that the global basis has to be calculated for the 400 ounce gold bar, the international yes. gold bar, which is roughly equivalent to 12 and a half kilogram bars. It's about that size, like a small brick, but very heavy, as you can see, compared to the size. And it, it is traded in London still, and traded in many other countries. And it's still the unit of uh, account for the bullion banks and central banks if they ever trade gold. They always refer to the international um, gold bar. And that is what gives you the global basis if you take the uh, difference between the nearest future price and the, uh, and the cash price. Now, for silver, I'm suggesting that perhaps it's the 1,000 uh, ounce bar. bar. Um, and and I'm, I'm not sure that this, uh, this is the uh, final answer, but right now I feel that it is th these two markets for these particular bars are the, the definitive markets where you have to watch the basis if you are looking for the global basis. And the local markets, 
give you guidance for your own trading, but not for the end game collapse of the monetary system. For that, you have to take the 400 ounce gold bar. Anything else is Could you stand up? So anything yeah. else is a temporary distortion or anomaly in the system? Or a local one, maybe not a temporary. Yeah, yeah. local. The local one. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Well, <laughs> coffee, yes, a coffee, coffee call. Um, we'll be back in 15 minutes, folks.